same time, we're supposed to be his servant. Jesus came not to be served, but to serve, and then to give his life as a ransom. And we are the ones who are supposed to be following Jesus, walking in his footstep, both teaching and healing, both feeding the hungry and caring for the sick in our society. And so as we begin to do that, people would always warn us, if you do this one, you're going to give up the other one. And so when we put CCDA together, we wanted to make certain that we don't give up that, that we, we want people to really see. Because a lot of folks are coming to us now, and they're coming because of the social program we're doing. They're coming because of the health center. They're coming because we are trying to rehabilitate uh, drug addicts. They're coming because we are working with prison. And they're coming because of that. You know, and that's a wonderful reason to come. But we don't want to give up this teaching of the Word of God and this teaching of the Word of God and us practicing it and living it out. And so to me, this is the centerpiece and we want this to always be the centerpiece of CCDA. We want it always to say that what we are doing is coming out of the Word of God and that we are ordering our steps by the Word of God. And so open your Bibles then to uh, first John and let's pray together father thank you so much for your goodness your grace and Lord thank you that we can be here together thank you that we can be here in New York City our largest city in the United States and Lord why is sometime uh, uh, uncomfortable in terms of the travel and the distance and, and being in this strange place Lord it is good we're here and Lord, we are so thankful that so many people from New York is coming out these days and joining with us. Now, Lord, we pray for this time. We pray for everybody that's here, that you would guide us, that you would lead us, that you would truly inspire us as we are bent on obeying you and doing your will. So now we ask that your Holy Spirit would come and teach us from your word. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. There are three basic themes in this little epistle of John that we are looking at. And I selected this epistle because um, I wanted these three themes to be brought out during our conference here uh, this week. Uh, the first theme in this here is that God is life that life has visited this world and eternal life has been revealed and that we can have that eternal life if we come to know his son and so that we get life by getting Jesus Christ. Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. And so that's one theme that's here. The other theme here is that God is light. Light. And this light here, we're going to see this light here today, is the light of God that enlightens us so that we can know the Word of God and live in obedience to Him. We're going to see that today. If we walk in the light as He's in the light, uh, we're going to see that today. And then the other theme which we are close out with, and that is love. God is love. These are the themes that we want to look at here today. The reason for this epistle then is the very fact that as I look at Christians and I'm hearing them all talking about they are burning out and it's they are doing the work of God and, and they're afraid they're going to burn out. It, it's because that we are trying to do the will of God in our own flesh. You see, the biblical thought is that Christ wants to live his life out in us. That's what the Apostle Paul was trying to get us to see in Galatians 2.20 when he said, I am dead with Christ, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lived in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And so the whole idea of the Christian life is that we are living out God's life here on earth. 
uh, that we have this life of God, this treasure of God's life and love in these earthen vessels so that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. And so it's not us ourselves that are doing the work. It is God who is doing his will through us. And he wants us to be humble, broken vessels so that he can live his life out in us in society. And so I see that. And what I'm finding is, as I said yesterday, that, that so many people are living these unhappy lives. That's why we have so much violence, so much divorce, so much crime. That's really, I think, is why we need all these pep uppers, why we need dope and all these other things, because we are sad and we're trying to create happiness in our life. And so the Christian life is supposed to be a life of, of joy, a life of gratitude to God. And our works for God ought to come out of what God has done for us and that we are living out our life in gratitude to what God has done for us. And that should be a life of joy. And one of my favorite verses in the Bible it says about Jesus and his life as he came into this wicked world. God visited this wicked world in the person of Jesus Christ. And he said, the word was made flesh and dwell among us, and we beheld his glory. And then it says also, for the joy that was set before him, that he endured the cross, he despised the shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the Father. And so it was the joy that was driving him on that was causing him to do it. And so the biblical thought is, the joy of the Lord is our strength. That we, that we have joy, we, we, we have joy because we have salvation. Uh, uh, I, I have a destiny itself. We know where we are going. And God has provided all of that in salvation. He forgave us for our sin. He forgives us day by day. And he has a place for us in heaven. He said, I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'm going to come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. So salvation is complete. And that we should be living in gratitude to God because if Jesus Christ came to this world and he worked out a perfect salvation for us. And so our destiny is salvation. And now we ought to be living our life out in gratitude for what he's done for us. We should almost be anticipating that time when our work is finished here that we can go to heaven and spend all eternity with him there on earth. And so we should have joy. It should be the joy of the Lord. The early disciples, when the church was developed, you know, Jesus sent them back into Jerusalem. And he gave them the Holy Spirit and said that when the Holy Spirit come upon you, you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and other parts of the world. You know what that really meant when it said, you shall be witness unto me? It meant that Jesus was telling them, and these disciples understood this, that you are going to go back to Jerusalem, and in Jerusalem, you're going to die for me in Jerusalem, you're going to die for me in Judea, you're going to die for me in Samaria, and you're going to die for me all over the world. And the Testament said, these disciples counted the joy to suffer shame for his name. And so the Christian life should not be a life of dreadry. It should be a life of joy as we live the Christian life out. And then the joy of the Lord becomes our strength. You see, the joy of the Lord is the, is the energy. It is, it is the fuel. It is like uh, the gasoline that go into the carburetor that causes the car to keep going. That's what joy is supposed to be. You know? And so this epistle here was written in order that we might have that joy. What was happening in this early church, John could see that happening. He could see that they, they were becoming cold, that they, they were becoming indifferent. You know, in, his, in, his, in, in the book of Revelation, when he writes to the church that he pastored there in, in Ephesus, he said, you have left your first love. And since you've left your first love, you have lost your joy. And so he's writing this letter to them so they might restore that joy so that they can be effective in society and they can take the suffering and the pain that go on with making God's will known here on earth. And let me say this, 
No, the will of God is everything. I mean, that's what we should be thinking about. That should be our meditation. When Even when Jesus taught us how to pray, that was right up front in his prayer. That when we pray, that we pray that God's will would be done. That his kingdom would come here on earth as it is in heaven. And what's burdened me today, that as I look at Christianity out there, that we have sort of molded God into our own image, and that God is there to sort of meet our need. And that we have just sort of limited God to meet our need. And the will of God is not in the center peace. And so the question always ought to always be, is this the will of God? I am looking to find the will of God to do the will of God here on earth, and that we should be doing that will with, with great and exciting uh, joy. So let's go to our uh, letter here, here and pick up our study here verse by verse as we, as we go along. And I'm going to pick it up here. Let me go back and pick it up at verse 3, and then we're going to go on through and into chapter 2 here to, to, today. That which we have heard and seen, declare unto you that you may also have fellowship with us. Now, the whole idea was that the, that the Christian church is to be um, um, a, a collective witness of people. That, that the biggest witness of us is, yes, we can make our individualistic witness, but the biggest witness is the way we behave with each other and that other people see our behavior with each other and how we love each other, that's the biggest witness to the world. They said that was the witness of the New Testament church. That's why they call them Christian first at Antioch. Because those early disciples was with Jesus and they were behaving just like Jesus behaved. You understand? And so there was a collective behavior and so the church is a body. It's more than just one. And that's the weakness of the church. We have a church today in the world, and there are believers, individual believers in the world. But those individual believers have not bound themselves together into a family that is strong enough for discipline and development so they can be strong, so they can endure the, the adversaries of life. And so they can endure. And that comes about a family. What I'm finding out today, that it's very difficult, even my own staff, I, I find it difficult to even talk to my own staff about things that are important. Because they are more concerned about themselves than they're concerned about the things of God. And they're so afraid they're going to be offended. Something is going to happen. You know, so they, they have not really committed themselves to anything that is greater than themselves. And we have made Christianity into that. And all Christianity do is to just sort of keep us happy as we walk on eggshells and not offending each other in the society. Well, we need to know each other better. We need to be in fellowship with each other better. We need a cause that is a bigger cause than our cause. A cause that binds us together. We need a cause like a military cause that we are concerned about our goals and objective of making Jesus Christ known. And that we are in, willing to endure some of the hardship. And, and so really the Christian, that Christianity that I see is just this Christianity to make people, you know, I listen at this. I listen at these. Sometimes I look at it as my wife is flipping the television. I listen at these prosperity preachers. And I want you to know that that is the ethos of our community now. Uh, they are the ones who control the networks, they control the television, and they control most of what you get as an image of Christianity. It is sort of God bless me, and if I sow a seed into this ministry somehow or another, God is going to multiply all of this back to me because I sowed a seed into this ministry. That's heresy. That's garbage. In our society, you don't give to God in order to get back. You give to God because of what He has provided, because you give to God in gratitude, because it's all belonged to Him. And that He made you a steward of it. And now you're trying to be a good steward of what God has given. And you hear that all the time. 
and I get good feeling. I, when I hear, sometimes I hear people in CCD say, let's sow a seed. One of my people said, I said, don't put that in no magazine. We want people to sacrifice. We want people to give up something. We want them to give up something they already have for the cause of Jesus Christ in the neighborhood. No, don't give in order to get. Give to God in gratitude to him. And so what we're trying to do here is bring our people back to authentic Christianity, a Christianity of sacrifice, Christianity of, 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 of suffering. And I want you to know that suffering is a virtue. That's the way God sharpens our faith. Count it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you fall into pain. God might not want you as healthy and wealthy as you think. God might want you to endure pain in order that you can understand pain and the agony and the suffering of others in society. And so let's go then and look at this. And so that what I'm talking about, my theme here ought to be, is that we need to develop that kind of bond, that kind of relationship to God, so we can have that relationship to each other. Now, the strength of our relationship to God is the strength of our relationship to each other. Now, I hear people all the time with this sort of religious talk, and they're always talking about how much I know God and what God said to me today, and they have no relationship with anybody around them. See, your relationship to God is in evidence by your relationship to each other. And so if you don't have relationship with your brothers and sisters around you, you don't have no relationship to God. And that's our theme today. And so we have a relationship with God. You see, that's when we was, when we was forgiven for our sin and we were saved and forgiven for our sin, God brought us into a relationship to himself. He's been brought into that relationship. We're in his body. We are in Jesus Christ. We belong to him. Now what's going to separate us from him is going to be our sin. But the same sin will separate us from our brothers and sisters. And, and so this epistle here is written so that we might have fellowship with God and that we also may show that fellowship by our relationship to other people. And we're going to hear here today that you can't say that you have a relationship with God and don't have a relationship with your brothers and sisters. And we're going to see that. And so the fellowship then is to be the powerful witness of God in a community and in the world. So the church here is to be the witness in the world. The church here has been left with the stewardship of this wonderful truth of the gospel. And we have to hold that that's been delivered to the saints. We have to hold that as a collective body of believers. Whenever I hear people too much talking about their truth and how much they know truth, and I got a church that believe in truth, it always scare me. Because they'll always send that truth back to some individual. And that's the way cults develop, is that somebody has, the truth was not left here with one individual. The truth was left here within a collective body. The truth has been delivered by God himself in the person of Jesus Christ, and he delivered that truth to 12 apostles. And it became a responsibility for the 12 apostles to perpetuate that truth in the world. And those apostles wrote that down in a book we call the Bible. And so it was not given to one individual, and it's not retained in the world by one individual. It's attained by the fellowship, by the body, by the presbyteria, by the elders within a local church. They're the ones that's there to contend for the truth, not just the pastor. The pastor is there to proclaim it and to nurture that. But then he has some people to oversee him or her so that it makes certain that that truth reflects the historical teaching of the Bible. So no one person have all the truth. It is left to the, to the body. And so let's go look then at this. So verse 3, let's go back there and let's get moving here. So that we might have fellowship with the Father and with the Son. Verse 3. And these things write we unto you then, that if you can have fellowship with the Father and with the Son, okay, and fellowship with each other, then we're going to have the joy that we need to do the work of God. 
so you can join might be full. Now he's going to get begin to explain that in verse 5. Listen to what he said in verse 5. This then is the message which we have heard of him. And John is talking about the message that he has heard directly from Jesus Christ. This is the message that we have heard of him, and we declare this unto you, that God is light. Now, we're going to see what the darkness is going to be. That God is light. And, and, and the darkness is going to be when we begin to hate each other and kill each other and air up with each other, we're going to see that we are walking in darkness. But we are walking in light. We're walking in fellowship and in love with each other. And then we're able to impact the society around us. Listen at him what he says here. This then is the message which we have heard of him. And we declare this unto you that God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. And verse 6 says this. Listen to this. For if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. So, look, verse 7 says, but if we walk in the light, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, then he says we have fellowship one with another. You see, walking in the light, being in a relationship with God, is being in relationship to your fellow man. And so that in that local body, you can be impactful because sin is not only going to trip you up, but it's going to trip up the whole neighborhood and the whole community. That's the little story of Ai. Do y'all know the story of Ai? When God was with the nation of Israel, calling them out of Egypt, in a very powerful way, God was there. He was there by the pillar of cloud by day. He was there in the pillar of fire by night. He was there hovering over the tabernacle, and he was there to help them. But when they went into a, a city, and they took that city, and what happened there, one of the people there, Achan, stole some gold and silver, and he kept that to himself. He hid it in his own tent. He was more concerned about himself than he was about the collective. And so when they got ready to go fight the battle again, they lost the battle. And they wanted to know then why were they losing the battle. And they were losing the battle because one of the members in the camp had sinned. And they couldn't win the battle because one of the members within the local church had sinned. That's a part of the fellowship. And then they could not win the battle until Achan come forward and confessed his sin. And when he confessed his sin, they went out and they were able to win the battle. See, sin then stops not only us individually, but it stops we the church then from being effective as we be the body of Christ in the community. That's what he's trying to say here, here in this. For we say that we have fellowship with him. And we say that we have fellowship with him. And walk in darkness, we, 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 we lie and do not the truth. But he said if we walk in the light, as he's in the light, then we have fellowship one with another. And then the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. Now, the biblical thought of Jesus' death on the cross is that he shed his blood historically for the remission of our sins. And he provided that. But the biblical thought is that Jesus' blood is available right now. And that same blood that was shed 1,900 years ago, that same blood is available right now to wash away my sin day by day. There's an old hymn I love so much. I have to depend upon it myself. It says, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilt and stain. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us now, day by day, from all of our sin. And it cleanses us so we can have fellowship with God and we can live that fellowship out in our relationship to each other and that we can be impactful uh, in the world. Let's go to verse 8 then. So his blood is what cleanses us from sin. Then verse 8 said, if we said that we have no sin, uh, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. Now, what did he mean here? What he's actually saying here, if we say that we don't get tripped up, 
sometime. I remember when I was a uh, uh, little and I used to hear our good old sanctified Church of God in Christ people uh, say these things like, uh, I'm free from sin and I haven't thought about sin in the day. And I used to say, that's set too high a standard for me. In fact, it's too a high standard even today for me. Uh, because I think about sinning. I think about sinning sometimes. But when I think about sinning, I also know that when I think about sinning, I need to go back to the cross again and ask him to forgive me for that thought of sin. But I do think about sinning. Think about sinning. And that's what he's saying here. If you say that you don't get tripped up from time to time and think about sin, if you say, what is sin? A sin is doing something that you know is wrong. But sin is not doing some of the things that you know is right. And that's called a sin of omission. And we know a lot of times the things that we ought to be doing that's right, we don't do that. And so we need to confess that before the Lord so that his blood can cleanse us, so that we can have that kind of relationship that we need to have. Uh, in, our, in, in, in our society. Now, the big, always the big question is, because some people teach this, some people teach that every time you sin, you got to get saved all over again. I know that a lot of folks take that, and there's a lot of folks believe that. Believe that. Uh, I, I think that's a, a little bit of a misunderstanding of the Bible, to say the least. When you sin, you break your relationship to God. And the big deal is that you also begin to break the relationship you have with your brothers and sisters. And that leaves you ineffective. You are not doing, you cannot do the will of God. And that's what you should be set on doing, the will of God. So when you sin, you cease to be able to do the will of God. You cannot do the will of God while you're living in your sin. And so the idea here then is to say that we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves. We're deceiving ourselves. And he goes on further than that and say, he goes on and say then, then the truth is not in us. The truth is not in us. And that we can be deceived. We can be deceived. I, I was able to see that in the South when I went back there. I could hear those white preachers on the radio and black preachers, but particularly these white preachers would be preaching these uh, sermons, uh, saying all these good things about Jesus, but there was no relationship they had to any other black people within the neighborhood. And I would hear him preaching these sermons like, let's go back to the religion of our founding fathers. And I would say, I don't want to go back there. I'd be a slave. Your founding father's religion is not that good. I said, why don't we go back to the Bible and try to find out what the Bible meant? Let's go back and let's try to live by the Bible. Let's don't live by the religion of our slave owners. Their religion was not good enough. Let's go back to, well, what had happened though, they had been self-deceived. You know, every once in a while, I get a little staff member on my thing. Sometimes I get a wonderful young white person on there, and they are more concerned about their historical religious doctrine that held people in subjugation. They are more concerned about that than reaching out to the poor and the hurting in society. And I look at them, and I feel sorry for them. We need a religion that authenticates itself with reality in society. We need a religion that is stronger than our race and our culture in our society. You get that? And so this is what he's, he's saying here, that we can be deceived. We can be deceived. And a lot of us is, and I tell you, if you are too tightly held to your denomination of views, that can be deceptive. Because all of that has a certain amount of heresy in it. All of it. So don't be, don't be so tightly held. And, and, you know, I, I see denomination as administration. I do not see them as being something that God ordained. I see them as something that God might have used, and he probably still can use them. Because God can use, just because you got a denomination name, don't stop God from using you. But, but, it, but it don't even assure you that God is going to use you. Because God is not dealing on that level at all. So don't get too sold out to that. You understand? As I say, except if, you, if you're a Presbyterian, that's wonderful. If you're a Baptist, that's wonderful. That you have that in your administration. If you're a Pentecostal, that's wonderful. 
Nothing wrong with that. But don't try to replace that with God. I meet these little narrow-minded people all the time. When they ask me whether or not I'm a Christian, they're going to put the test by one of their little narrow doctrinal statements. That's too narrow. That's too narrow. That we should, we should trust, we should, we should judge the Christians by their behavior. The, ch the, ch the, the church tree should be known by the fruit it's bearing. And if it's bearing good fruit of love and compassion and all of those fruits of the Spirit, then we can say, that's good fruit. But if it's hatred, even of people who don't believe like you believe, then that means that you don't quite understand in society. So look at this now. So he says then, if we confess our sins, verse 9 says then, this is the way we get rid of our sins. What do it mean to confess? Let me share with you what it means to confess. To confess is to you agree and speak it out to God what God already knows. That's what it means to confess. To come and to say to God what God already knows that you've sinned. And so we come before God, we confess our sins uh, to Him uh, before God. And you, you, you know that the confession too, if your sins is sins that cause each other pain, then you really need to uh, experience some form of repentance. That's really important. That's really important. Because when God's spotlight of love shine into your life that brings about repentance, it shows you what you consider to be a very little sin is a very big sin before God. And repentance is then you begin to see that sin as God sees it. You begin to see that sin as something big. And what you thought was little now becomes big. And now you cry out to God and you say, God, I have sinned. I have sinned. I have sinned. And you confess that. So confession. You know, my, I listen to people sometimes. And they, they take, I, I work on altars sometimes when they're having revival and things. And I listen to people talking to people once they come down to accept Jesus Christ as Lord of their life. And, and sometimes those people haven't had a good enough vision of their sin. I, I, I think when people get a good vision of their sin, it's going to create some pain and a little agony in their life. You, you know, you know, when you see your sin as being the way God sees them, he sees them as awful. And that should bring about some repentance. I think that we have made the expression of knowing Jesus Christ a little bit too easy. I believe that there's a, there's a, there's a power of conviction that ought to come with people seeing the depths of their sin. And so this confession here is not just a little old bitty deal. It's a big deal when we confess our sins. Then he says, though, that God, he is faithful, and God is just, and that he will forgive us of our sins, and that he will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I like that. I like that. And I know when I was first converted, you know what I would do uh, when I first converted, I, I realized that God forgave me for my bad sin that I committed. But then what I would do when I was first converted, I would be thinking about the sins that I had done. And I would be asking God, God would remind me of those sins. And I would be continually confessing those sins to Jesus Christ until I felt like that I was absolutely free from that sin. So if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us of sin. And then he says in verse 10, listen to what he said in verse 10. Again, he, because he's saying things, he's repeating things. Here he says, but we say that we have not sinned. Uh, we, he've already said that once in this passage, but now he's saying it again. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar. And his word is not in us. This is strong language. That if you say that you have not sinned, you are making God a liar. And he says, and his word is not in us. 
Then he goes on here in, in, in verse 1 of chapter 2. He says, My little children, these things write unto you that you sin not. He said, I'm writing this unto you, you know, because that's where you, 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 if you, be, you have to be careful here with this passage because you make this easy Christianity. This is Christianity made a little bit too easy. This is Christianity without repentance. This is Christianity without pain when you make it easy. And that's what I'm trying to show you. When you repent, when you see the depth of your sin, you see it as sinful. And then he, that's why he keep repeating this. That's why he keep repeating this. My little children, these things write on to you that you sin not. You know, you know, if it's this easy, you, you know, then you can say, well, if I sin, well, so what? I'm just going to confess it to the Lord. And you're going to assume upon God, sin is bad. Sin is bad. And so we don't need to live with that sin in our life. And we need to confess it before God. My little children, these things why don't you use your sin not? But then as he think about that, he also think about the depths of God's grace. I mean, God's grace is wonderful. You don't have to live with your sin. You don't have to live, you know, and I, and I meet people, the hardest thing that I find out in my working with all of you five or six hundred organizations across the country is to, for you to acknowledge when you have done wrong. Isn't that hard? For you to acknowledge when you have done wrong. You understand? When you see, when you see that, but he says here, when you sin, and when we sin, uh, we have an advocate with the Father. That means that not only have Jesus died to provide a salvation for us and to provide the provision for our sins to be confessed day by day, but Jesus is also sitting up on the right hand of the Father. And from that position, he's looking down here on us. And, and really what he wants us to do and he, what the Holy Spirit to do and what he wants the good teaching of the Word of God to do is to convict his people who are walking in sin. Because he really can't advocate for them until they ask him. You understand? He can't advocate. He's sitting out there and he's waiting on you while you're walking out of fellowship with him. This is grace. This is grace. You are walking down here on earth out of fellowship with God. You're walking down here on earth not being effective. You're walking down here on earth, not having a relationship with your brothers and sisters, and Jesus Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father, and it's almost like he is sitting there waiting, and he's saying, oh, I wish that my child would confess. If my child would confess, then I could forgive them, and they could have this joy restored. And so he's sitting there ready to tell the Father, but even if we don't do that, even if we don't do that, even if we don't confess, and as we, and even if God has that, that sin cause us to go to heaven to be with him, I think Jesus is up there with the Father and saying, this is my child. This is my child. Uh, this is my disobedient child. This is my disobedient. He is there to plead our cause. He's there hoping that he can answer our prayers in terms of we are confessing. But even if we don't confess, he's an advocate there. He's there for our sins. And not only he's there for our sins, but he's there for those people out there who have not ever confessed their sin. And all they have to do is to confess it. That's what it means here, that he's not only an advocate for our sin, but he's for the sins of the whole world. It means that he has provided redemption. And he has provided forgiveness for anybody in the world. So anybody in the world who would cry out to God and say, I'm a sinner and I need help. God who is seated at Jesus, who is seated at God's right hand, would say, that's my child. That's my child. And then he would be a saved person. Let's continue here as I bring this, uh, this time here to a close. This is where I want to get to. This is the verse I really wanted to get to uh, here today, is how can we know that we know God? That's in verse 3. That's important. That's important. How can we know that we know Him? We can know that we know God if we walk in His commandment. And what is His commandments here? His commandment is this. This is God's commandment in the Old Testament 
This is God's commandment in the New Testament. This is the way that we can know that we believe in Jesus Christ. This is the way we can know that we are a child of God. And the way that you can know that you are a child of God is by the way you love your sisters and brothers around you. He's going to say that in that passage. If we say that we love God and hate our brothers, we lie and do not the truth. And so to say that you know God is to have this kind of relationship to his brothers and sisters. You know, um, the other day they called, these people did this wonderful honor thing to me. And as I sit there and listen at that honor, and I realize that the only reason that I've been able to do anything that I've been doing during these 40 years, it has been because of the friends, the brothers and sisters that God has given me. And that's the way we need to understand that. We, need to, we not need to be boasting before God, talking about what God has done for me. God says, give, and it shall be given unto you. Press down, shaken together, will your brothers and sisters give to you. We're supposed to develop a faith that we not only trust in God, but we trust in each other. And that we see that our help and our support comes from each other. Well, let's pray, and we'll be back again uh, uh, tomorrow. Okay. Father, we thank you so much for your goodness and your grace. And we thank you for this time together. Now we pray for Thaddeus as he comes to talk to us and to share with us. Give him liberty. Make him a creative witness for your glory and honor. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.